Hello, everybody. My name is Sammy Torberg. I'm a chef, I'm a biohacker, I'm author of many, many cookbooks and I'm specialized in wild food. And the reason why I originally got into wild food is it's basically surreal. I was working in Shoreditch, London, and then we had this super hectic Thursday lunch service. This is like 15 years ago. But anyway, it was Rivington Grill, right in the heart of Shoreditch. And it was a very hectic moment and restaurant was packed. I was running the service. I was head chef there. And uh, normally the suppliers, they come through the back door by 10 o'clock in the morning so that we chefs know what to expect delivery wise. But on this miraculous day, 15 years ago, pretty much exactly, it was in May, and my life changed completely. And that's, <clears throat> that's down to Miles Irving, this hippie that I had no clue about previously. But on that strange, miraculous day, Miles walked into the restaurant in the middle of the lunch service and asked me if I want to buy some sea kale. And I was, I was stunned. I was like, who the F are you? What the F are you doing here this time of the day? And what the F is sea kale? It was such a bizarre moment. So I kind of felt in my gut that, oh, this is something I need to look into. So I said to Miles that, yeah, I'm interested, but you need to wait. So Miles basically stood next to us in the kitchen for almost two hours because we had to feed the 100 head client in the restaurant. And once we were past the busiest period, I took a handful of sea kale from his bag that he was carrying on his shoulder. I was like, oh, what's this? It looks great. And uh, I had to ask Miles advice how to cook it because I've never seen it. It looked a bit like broccoli, but it was also very similar to globe artichoke in energy wise. I was like, well, how do you do this? So Miles suggested me that just give it a brief boil and serve it with hollandaise sauce. Like we had had that already on the plus, like you say, because it was asparagus season. So he was kind of uh, advising me to use it the same way as asparagus or globe artichoke indeed. So I quickly blanched it seasoned it and had a good spoonful of hollandaise sauce on it and I tasted it and brothers and sisters I can guarantee that this single plant sea kale is the most novel plant on planet earth so that was my uh, first kind of a contact with wild herbs and the day went on as follows I, I took the whole bag from him basically there was like 60 portions of sea kale and I put it on the menu as a daily special on the same night and the restaurant opened, reopened on the day at six o'clock in the evening. And by seven o'clock, it was sold out. So I was like, oh, yes, it's not just me or the hippie who was keen on knowing and eating more wild. And then I continued using the sea kale for several weeks. And as a chef, I've always been very passionate about understanding your ingredients. So I always want to go to source to understand where they come from. What, what are they doing there, the plants or fish or animals or so on. So that as a chef, I understand what I'm dealing with. Then I can present that kind of a chain of information to clients. So I went to do my very virgin foraging 15 years ago in Kent, UK. And that day totally changed my life professionally, but also as a human being, because it was optimum season for foraging sea kale. So the baskets we had, they were like full within 10 minutes. So we had like, oh, what's, what's next? So we were chucking oysters and eating as many as you can in one go. That's about two doses, two, dozen, two dozens, I mean. <laughs> and uh, we were full <clears throat> with those. And I was like wondering that, what's this beautiful smell here? And then I noticed that the whole coastal line was covered in wild fennel and because it was blooming it was beautiful very clear and shiny yellow flowers in it and the Atlantic wind was blowing that aniseed 
aroma directly into my nostrils. So I, ha I had no other choice than just surrender to nature. So sea kale, wild fennel, and also during the same foraging trip, we were looking for St. George's mushrooms and we found zero. But we found this magical spot in the middle of the woods and there was this tiny, tiny river, like stream rather. And it was very powerful and all areas around the stream was covered with very beautiful, young, and shining green and perky watercress. And that was it. The watercress finalized this awakening into foraging in my case. And it's been a long, but it's been very colorful and teaching path ever since. And what it also taught me, not just to find edible plants that are tasty, but the, uh, the time spent in nature offered me a well-needed balancing for working in a hectic, stressful, uh, hot kitchen with pressure. So there I was in the middle of paradise. <laughs> and as I was willing to let the nature come in, let all the teachings, all the wisdoms come into me, I've surrendered to this. And then years ago, I returned to Finland uh, using wild herbs and foraging had become like essential part of my food philosophy. So I've, I've written like 11 books about wild herbs, wild mushrooms and Nordic foods, etc. But why we are here today is that I would like to uh, <clears throat> introduce you how easy foraging is and how it actually happens. And because we are in Finland and most of the Nordic countries as well have the same thing, every man's right, which means that every, every one man or woman has a right to do foraging. And you don't have to be a Nordic person, you don't have to be a Finnish person, you can be from any part of the world. But if you are here, let's say in southwest coast Finland, where we now, you have right to do this. And that's a good thing that you have right, because we all should have right to access this wild green supermarket, like I like to call it. So wild nature is definitely my favorite supermarket, my favorite gallery and a sanctuary indeed. So I will, I will now guide you through some plants, maybe five to 10 plants that we will find on our way. Then I'll make you a little design creation. Okay. Uh, nowadays, I use over 100 plants, trees or shrubs, and I've divided them into five categories. First one is salad leaves, second one is herbs, and then there's substantial vegetables, and fourth category is aromatic plants, trees and shrubs, and then the fifth category is medicinal herbs. And most of these <clears throat> plants, trees and shrubs, at this time of the year can be used as a salad. So that's what I'm gonna show you how to do. And we're gonna start with birch tree. This is a young individual. It can be older as well, if that's not a thing here, but the leaves need to be young. So at this time of the year in May, they are pretty much the maximum size they can be to be used in salads. They are yellowish, beautiful green, colored, they are shiny, they are almost translucent, and they taste just like hazelnuts and lemon. So this is basically luxury quality salad leaf. Mm. So good. Easy to forage as well. Like this. And the next, next plant, hello, is bilberry. Everybody knows how, how much health benefits blueberries have. 
Well, this blueberry, in fact, bilberry we have here is beyond that. It's like times 11 easily. And before the berries come, they come like midsummer. We have the leaves, which are beautiful. Look at this. And they taste absolutely oregano-ish and lemony. And then if we pick the flowers with us, that are the berries in early stage, we also get the honey kind of sweetness to this creation. Seems to be a great year for bilberry, the blooms. Working out like magic. So this is how easy it is. So if we uh, like put in a nutshell, how, how, do, how do we actually learn this foraging? Is that we open our minds up for this fact that there is a wild green supermarket. Then we go there to nature. Then we need to learn to identify plants. That's the hardest part, but I can tell you it's not that hard. And then it's optimum that we pick it ourselves. Then we get in a full swing. And then the final bit, the climax is that we eat it. So I can explain you this and I hope you enjoy this. Uh, but I'll tell you the truth at the end, what really is the key to understand this all. So now we have <clears throat> birch leaves and bilberry leaves and flowers. Pretty good start. Our national tree and national berry, birch and bilberry. Ah, what we have here? So this is it like once you get down to plant, you might never get up because there's so many other plants around it. We have a rowan. It's a shoots of rowan tree. This is actually a holy tree. So, yes, we have permission. It's a rowan shoots. If you happen to like almonds, apricots, or cherries, this is for you. Because this flavor and aroma is just insane. Because we almond like. Okay, in they go. Yeah. Here we have sorrow. Very early stage, so they're tiny, but this is definitely worth picking. If you happen to like salt or lemon, this is for you. And this particular plant is in season for at least six months. So, this foraging season, if we're talking about Finland and pretty much other Nordic countries, to be honest, it starts in March and you get the micro shoots. Then in April, you really get the shoots of many, many plants. And in May, it all just explodes slowly. Like this spring is pretty cold in, in temperature. So it's actually ideal. So we have longer season to forage these beautiful young turkey plants. And then in June, most of the plants, they flower. And then there will be new plants coming into this range during the June and July. And then with many plants, the season still lasts through August, September. There's a lot less in September, but once you get into this, you, are, you know what's still in season. And also in October and some plants still in November. So foraging edible, wild, fresh plants is available here for nine months for fresh season. And then when you include the berries and mushrooms, it's just insane how much food we have around us. And it's basically free. All you need to give in exchange is respect the nature. And once you start respecting the nature, you, you have a possibility to understand that we are nature. We are not separate from nature, but we are part of it. So that's where the journey really starts. And what we have here as well is juniper. 
everybody knows gin. So this is one of the ma main flavor compounds in making gin. We have juniper berries. And in order to get these almost black and bluish juniper berries, it takes four years. They start from this green berry and it's like two years it takes to become like this. Then third year it becomes bluish and then on the fourth year they come like black. Let's see, here is one which is actually four years. All right. We all know what gin tastes like, so we get an idea what this tastes like. It's basically medicinal and super sweet taste. There's so many of these. This is a great find because most of the time birds find this before humans. The green ones as well. And uh, <coughs> to to start foraging or to do this foraging is. It's so easy. You don't need to go to very deep in the forest. Like here we are in a coastal bit and we find these plants. There's more sorrel. And the, uh, the range of plants, it varies like where you are, depending where you are on the coastal area or if you are in the middle of the spruce woods or around the meadows or fields or yards. So, my suggestion is that you go and do foraging wherever you find that it's clean and pleasant to do foraging. And then scan around and see what edible plants you find and make this salad out of those. Because that's the way to connect with the nature around you. So it's not just finding edibles or making delicious meal, but on top of that, you also connect with your very surroundings. And it's also good once you get into this habit and you make this salad, so you kind of understand the flavor profiles of. And once you get into foraging, you you start to experience and understand the flavor profile. So you pick like kind of certain amounts of each. So in order to make one fine combination, i.e art installation. Well, hello. What's this one? This one is called garlic mustard. And if you had to guess what it tastes like, uh, the name gives away quite a lot. <laughs> it tastes like garlic and mustard. And it's super sweet at this stage. So here we have flower bud. So when the plant is making flowers and before the flowers are open, there's a flower bud stage. And this is the finest stage of each plant, if you ask me, because it's so sweet and succulent and tender. I'm getting excited about this salad now. I wasn't expecting to find this, so this is the best way to forage. Just let the nature around you guide you.
now I'm experiencing the the real core reason for foraging that I've been here now for 20 minutes or so and my heartbeat is getting lower and I'm relaxing I'm seeing colors different shades of green I'm seeing different shapes I see that the old pine tree looks just like a turtle shell and I'm starting to see a lot more food so it takes a little while to adjust your mind for this setup nature has installed for us. This beautiful pine, thank you, is offering us flowers. They are like super early stage, so you can't really see them that they are flowers until you pick it and you look inside. It basically looks like annual growth, but once you do this, you see that it's actually flower inside. And this, if something is absolutely super food. Basically all these plants that I'm foraging today are medicinal, but this one is a, a true energy booster. In fact, it contains testosterone in natural form and not just one form, but as far as I'm informed correctly, it's like there's six different types of testosterone in this flower. Think about that. Mm, so crunchy. Ah. <sighs> the sun, sea, trees, rocks, birds, myself, connected with everything. Aha, this is what life is about. <laughs> it's not about the annual business growth it's about living the life being here now <laughs> one with everything ah this is what life is about yeah <laughs> this is what life is about and we're not gonna go into ants today we let ants do their own stuff But let's go to actual coast and see what's there. Ah, sorry. And this is it. Once you decide to go somewhere and get something, you decide, or, or the nature guides you to other direction and offers you totally different than you expect. Check this out. Stunning spruce flowers. <laughs> wow. This particular one is a good example about the fact that when foraging, when talking about foraging, it's good to remember that every year is different. So there's a lot of uh, vintage difference. Oh, check out this pollen. Wow. Spruce pollen. Lemony. And it's crunchy like peanuts. Sexy, sexy flowers. 
this one I will preserve also in vinegar. So most of these plants are also good for preserving. One of my books, it's called Wild Herb Cookbook. It's in English and it's also in Finnish and Swedish. It shows you over 100 different plants and season chart for all of these. And let's say out of these 100 that I use, over 60 are ideal for preserving. So when we preserve this, basically we can eat wild easily around the year. And if you want to do a preserving, the time is now and June. And about the preserving is, you know that you are preserving enough when you think, oh, I'm preserving too much. This is crazy. <laughs> That's the only way to make it last through the cold and harsh and dark winter times. Check this out. There's also spruce shoots, annual growth here. Yeah. Uh, picking season for this is just about to start, so they are tiny. They will grow up to like five times this size. They are super lemony. If you like lime, this is for you. And this is one of the oldest ingredients for Nordic cough medicine. So it's pure medicine. I can't help picking these flowers. I've got basically enough, but they're so sexy. So, so let's have some shoots as well. Yep. So here is a little bit better spot for spruce shoots. They're still tiny, but it's not about the size. Lovely weather. It's raining just an hour ago, and I feel the air so crisp and clean. The skies are clear now. What do we have here? Got some dandelion after rain, so the flowers are not so open. It's just rain, but they are super uh, moist and perky. And when we make this salad, if you are in urban surroundings, might be an idea to wash them. But I, ideally, I don't want to wash them. Because um, on top of the, uh, the minerals, the vitamins, the A-grade form of um, fiber they include, and all the untreated information from Gaia they contain, on top of that, they basically also contain wild probiotics together with the prebiotics. So if, if the nature around is clean, do not wash them. Just make sure there's no sand in your mix. Ah, oh, what do we have there? Dandelion. Dandelion. Like French call it dandelion. We have also yarrow, this is great. This is one of the most important medicinal herbs we have here in Finland. It's basically multi-purpose plant. It's being used on your skin or orally, on many, many, many issues. And when we make food out of this, Flavor-wise, aroma-wise, you could think of uh, provincial herbs, so thyme, rosemary, marjoram, bay leaf, and so on. And here's another plant that is actually medicinal 
So you need to be very careful when you do this foraging. Uh, you need to identify the plants as edible before you make this. So that's the number one rule. Before you even taste or make food out of it, you need to be 100% sure that it's edible. Some more dandelion. With dandelion, leaves are ideal to use as salad leaves. You can wilt them in a pan like spinach. And even in Finland, there is like 500 different varieties of dandelion. So how bitter they are, it varies. This one is very bitter because it's like a very sharp edges on this leaf. And the smoother the edges of the leaf are, the less bitter they are. But to be honest, the reason why we eat this is the bitterness. That's where all the goodness lies in. So you can use the leaves and the flowers. And before the flowers open, you use flower buds. They're just like peas or wild baby Brussels sprouts. And if you happen to like honey or licorice, this is for you. This is just like a wild honey and licorice marshmallow. You can eat them as they are. And this beauty, you can use it as a straw to drink your wild herb martini or just use it in the salads. And this is my very, very favorite part of it. It's so crunchy. Mm. Here we have a little bit bigger pine flowers. Oh man, we're gonna have to come back to this spot <laughs> for preserving. Wow. Yes. And we can take some of the sprouting parts as well, so the annual growth or kind of a tarry and resiny taste together with lemony medicinal flowers. And new growth flowers. Ah, we have another type of sorrel. The one we had earlier is called sheep sorrel. This one is called common sorrel. Well, common, yeah, it's pretty common. There's nothing common in this. It's just pure flavor. Salty and highly acidic. And if it's flowery, use the flowers as well. Wow. Okay. We've got a pretty nice mix now. But I would like to have a look there if we find the sweet grass that happens to be a sacred herb. It's basically cleaning out of bad spirits and making you calm. So this uh, sweet grass, yes, there is some. It's basically sacred herb. And uh, yes, we have a permission to go and get some. We'll pick some flowers. And it does, it's got highly relaxing qualities in it. And as the wiser say, it might also <clears throat> be so medicinal that it might like um, open up your childhood traumas. <laughs> so when you do this foraging, you might get into quite deep layers of well being and your past lives, even. Who knows? But this time we'll take some flowers and have a few of those in the salad. It's wet here. Be careful. Oh, thank you for letting me be here. And uh, I'm sure you like, or at least know, a Polish vodka called Subrovka. They use this or very similar plant that has cumarin in it. So flavor profile wise, this is basically tonka bean, vanilla and cinnamon. Very, very fragrant. So this is actually plenty for the salad. 
Oh, the smell. Ah, oh, check that out. Ah, uh, yes. Kind of hoping to find this. Wild onions, chives, wild chives. Beautiful. It hasn't flowered just yet at all. So it's super sweet and super tender. And very good. Had a great texture and onion flavors to the cellar. You can use a knife or scissors when foraging, but I've never, never really felt the need of them. Sometimes if we, if we uh, forage a lot of something, which is probably good, but this time just hands will do it. Now, the fun part. Uh, the fun part of foraging is to make food out of it. What do we have here? We've got at least nine different plants that are very, very carefully designed by very complex system. Mother Earth together with Father Day. Here we go. Put it put all of this into a bowl and as described earlier some of this, these flavors are very very strong and even harshly bitter garlicky mustardy lemony nutty resiny uh, medicinal herbal super fragrant so this is it looks pretty easy and in fact, it's super easy, but you just need to know your plants and respect the nature around you and get the permission to do this. You put all these plants in the bowl with salt. Pepper. And vinaigrette. Oil, vinegar, and mustard. And as described earlier, some of these might be very strong as they are. So, what this salt and pepper and vinaigrette does is the actual magic comes together. And this super strong individually flavored plants become one salad that comes together like that. And when we taste it, what happens is they all come together and create a unique explosion, fireworks kind of sensation on our taste buds. And this is my way to chip in for this design fair. Now I would like to underline that I'm here just a messenger, that this is basically totally designed by Mother Earth and Father Day. Now, if I just taste this, 
this is going to be impossible to describe what it tastes like. I have no words. All I can say is we must be in heaven, man. Namaste. If you have any questions, I would be more than happy to. Answer them. So Elsa is asking that she lives in the city surrounded by a few small and large green spaces. What would your top tips be for someone who would like to start foraging in urban areas but doesn't know what to look for? Well, dandelion is everywhere. Ground elder is pretty much everywhere. Garlic mustard is pretty much everywhere. Uh, depends if you are in like in European area. Wild rocket is everywhere. Uh, wild fennel is very common. So I would start with those. And Bridget is asking, can you offer some tips for someone who is completely new to foraging, but tip particularly about doing it safely? Yeah, you need to basically read the basics out of internet or the books, or if you can, get yourself into a foraging trip. Like this is a good way to get into this idea and hopefully get inspiration and get some sensational tips from this. But what you really need to do is get to nature with somebody who knows. And then once you've done the foraging five steps I said earlier, then you're safe. And always be very careful, be more careful than you need to. And only take what you need. Always take a little bit less than you need for the sake, for the sake of respecting nature. Ah, Calvin is asking, if foraging became more widespread, what positive effects would it have on society? Well, I'll tell you what it would have as a positive effect on society. Your, our well-being would increase dramatically. <laughs> Amen. And Calvin is also asking, how can we educate people better about foraging? Well, one of my most memorable foraging teaching gigs is, I've done like very high end gigs as well, but one of the most memorable gigs is I was teaching uh, primary school students to do this, because obviously the future lies within the youth and children. So I think every human, no matter what part of the world we are, we should be learning this as children. Yeah. Make sense? I agree. Yeah. That's all the questions. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Lotta Petronella, for filming. It's been great, great pleasure to just pass on the message from Mother Earth. You're very welcome.